But if you don't understand this, you see this happening everywhere around you. Now keep this in your mind and start seeing people are able to predict x-rays from x-rays. People are able to predict grades from faces. People are able to predict terrorism from faces. What exactly do they mean? Is there a causal theory connecting the input data to the output? No. Can you learn even when there is no causal theory? Yes. Does the society want that to happen? Fine for Facebook predictions. Not fine for gender prediction. Not fine for recidivism prediction, which is another place where basically learning got into bad uh, repute. Um, in, in Florida, people would use this um, actually feature-based learning system, not even a high-dimensional one, to predict whether or not somebody is likely to go back to a life of crime if they were to be let out. And the judges basically have to decide whether to bail you or whether to basically put you back in jail. Judges were using this particular piece of software called North Point software, North Point Compass system. And if you ask the judges, they say, no, 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 we are not dealing, we're just using that as one of the many, many inputs because after all, judges want to keep their jobs. If they just say we are using a program, they'll say, okay, instead of you, the program sits in your chair. So they'll say, no, no, we are not using a program. But when you actually look at their decisions, their decisions were basically highly correlated with what the program said. And this program essentially has no causal theory of what actually causes recidivism. And it's been shown to have high amount of race bias. So for example, browns and blacks, eh, they're likely to go back. Good old white boy, yeah, good people. It's not that somebody did this on purpose. It is just a learner that learned the correlations in the test data, and in the training data, and then just applied it to the test data. OK? So you have to keep all of these things in mind. So anyway, in the high dimensional tasks, learned features may not have any meaning to the humans in the loop, typically very high dimensional a 256 by 256 image will be having 65,000 pixel intensities. So 65,000 dimensional input. Where is that an I1 and I2 XR? That's two <laughs> dimensional. So you write in big letters in your thing, did neural networks, Boolean gates. Okay, you should at least understand the differences. This is 256 by 256. Nobody uses them. They're only used for like emojis. If you want to generate Hollywood style pictures, you need at least 4K, not even 4K really, but at least 4K. And a 4K image will have 26 point, in fact, by the way, even this is not 65K, because the intensity is typically split into RGB components for images. So it's three times 65,000. Okay? And for the 4K image, it is 4096 by 2160 times three, that's 26.6 million inputs. You need a learning theory that works for two to 10 inputs as well as 26 million inputs. Do we have such a theory? as we'll figure out for the rest of the class, no. What we have is mostly a theory that sort of works for this, and we're trying to figure out what actually makes sense for high dimensional learning. In addition to the fact that some people, oftentimes, because these high dimensional tasks are, nobody is going to question whether or not you're doing anything reasonable because this is neural networks, it's amnets, you must be doing something right. So people could take, for example, you, here is a way you can convert Boolean gate classification problem into a high dimensional classification problem. Take the picture. <laughs> take the picture. So the input is i1 equal to 0, i2 equal to 0. Picture. <laughs> if you take it in 4K, it's a really high dimensional picture. <laughs> and train a network which is at least 365 layers. 
at that point of time, you have deluded yourself magically to think great stuff is happening. And if you think this is a joke, I can show you papers being written in the state-of-the-art conferences where people take a picture of a set of logical formulas and feed it to the neural network. Why? Because nobody can question that you are not state-of-the-art. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? I'm hoping that at least you won't do that. Just because we have a picture doesn't mean that you should take pictures and feed that. Because oftentimes, the concepts that we have actually are low dimensional and it's much better to do the learning in that space. When you have a theory for a space, use the theory instead of asking the learner to figure out. If you ask the learner to figure out, learner will figure out correlations and then don't complain. And so this basically is a weird way in which, remember the beginning of the class, we talked about Polanyi's revenge and uh, uh, tacit versus explicit knowledge. The connection here is these typically are used for domains where there is explicit knowledge. And these for tacit. Things that work for tacit domains will also work for explicit. But they would do things that you have no idea why that what they're doing, other than saying, yeah, it looks like it's working. So if in fact I was able to give you grades, and not too many of you complained because I did tell you that I trained Niharika's class uh, mug shots uh, to figure out their grades, and I used that to give you grades. You will get used to it, especially because I kind of prepared the ground. I said, grades can be anything. I can be all sorts of stuff. I said, the law must have gotten some divine inspiration, and this must be my grade. Do you see what I'm saying? But then if I tell you, oh, I took your face picture, <laughs> then you will yell. Especially you will say, on that day, I didn't have good hair. At least take a picture from a good hair day. <laughs> then I would have a better chance. OK? OK, so any of you who may need to leave, please leave. I will continue for 30 more minutes so that we we'll just have one half set of things. versus low dimensional tasks. Um, so now, given that we have talked about how to evaluate learning algorithms, now we can talk about the old stuff, about bias variance trade-off, which we talked about earlier, which is this compression. Are we doing compression or learning? OK? Um, and one of the things we talked about at that point of time is as you drive down the training error, in the beginning, typically, the validation error will reduce, but will start raising. Or the test error, or the validation error, will reduce and will start raising. OK? And when that happens, you are actually overfitting to the noise in the training data. This is what we talked about. This is the traditional learning theory with overfit. OK? So, the question is, uh, um, if you assume, so if one of the funny things about neural networks is you can use them for this as well as this. But for this, pretty much the only game in town is deep learning right now. Very deep 
uh, very high parameter intensive uh, neural networks. Those are the only things that even work for this. Nothing else seems to work right now for this, as of now. But for this, there's a whole bunch of normal classical machine learning algorithms, logistic regression, decision trees, um, statistical learning, etc., etc., plus also neural networks. So when people say neural networks, they, they basically, when they use, they would say deep learning was used to learn Boolean functions, because deep learning is what gives you jobs. But the problems that we talk about deep learning here are different from the problems we talk about it here. Here, the deep learning or the multilayer neural network learning works exactly the same way any of the rest of the machine learning works. Which is essentially, it will have this bias variance trade off. And in particular, the way to actually, uh, the way to actually decide how to, you know, one of the questions you have is how big should the network be? How many layers? How many nodes? How many connections? This is the usual stuff people tend to start thinking of when they think of you know, network learning. Right? So if you are doing it in a low dimensional space, the usual idea is keep track of the validation set error. And if the validation set error is first coming down and it's increasing as you keep giving more examples, that means your network is probably overfitting. If on the other hand, if the validation error is not coming down and it's just sort of plateauing at a certain level, that means your network doesn't have the capacity to learn this function, which normally doesn't happen in neural networks uh, if you essentially have one hidden layer which is wide enough, then you can learn any function. But if, you, if it's not wide enough, then it may actually not learn some functions with a given number of examples. So the engineering advice in doing this would be, if the training loss is too high, then maybe the network size needs to be increased. So you're unable to even drive down the training set noise. Then maybe you need more parameters that can be tuned such that you can drive down the error closer to zero. If you increase the size of the network, you increase the number of tunable parameters which in some sense increases the number of features. Okay, and so then you can essentially, this is what you had in mind when you, when you said, if I try to fit the gender, I mean the, the grade uh, to the face of a person, I would be able to fit it. You knew that this is possible. Because there are just enough training knobs, you will be able to find a way of fitting it. Okay, and of course in those cases, basically the question is, especially in the case of feature-based learning, if the training loss does go to zero, but the validation loss first reduces and then starts increasing, then your network is overfitting or it is memorizing the data. So it's not going to be doing well on the test data. Yes? Sorry, but what's the definition of training loss and validation Okay, so loss is basically the error. Okay, and accuracy is the opposite of it. Okay, training loss is the error on the training set. You see, when, when I'm, basically I'm using the training error to actually change the weights. But any given point of time, I know how much error I am, how many training data samples am I misclassifying. That's the training loss error. As the learning pro progresses, if you have enough capacity, you will have training loss to become zero. Capacity means think of having higher order polynomials. Okay, then you will be able to fit any random set of points such that the polynomial goes through all those points. So the training data can eventually be made zero. If on the other hand, if I'm only looking for lines, the training and, and my data is basically not a straight line data, then training loss will never be zero. You guys get that, okay? Now validation is essentially the same thing except for the validation set, okay? So on the validation loss, um, if it's fast reducing and it's increasing, then your network is overfitting or memorizing. In that case, you need to reduce the size of the network, or um, 
in, uh, in this uh, the cellular network or keep the network size the same and use the regularization uh, such as dropout method which I will hopefully mention before the class is over. Okay? But this is for sort of reducing overfitting. Okay? Uh, yes, there is a question. Yeah, basically, eventually it will also memorize the validation set. It will take a little longer to memorize the validation set. But what's mentioned here is memorizing the training data. In fact, one of the interesting things that you are, if you have sufficient capacity, then the network can learn anything in the sense that it can drive down training data error to zero. Here is an example of that. If you took ImageNet data, okay, which has 200 classes, the pictures of you know dogs, cats, human beings, etc., and there are 200 classes. Oh, no, it has 1,000 classes. Sorry, it has 1,000 classes. 200 are just dogs, which is a problem with the ImageNet. That's why it mostly imagines dogs. There are you know it's going on. Uh, just like we dream of humans, ImageNet trained neural network <laughs> dream of dogs. Look at Deep Dream, it will be full of dogs and cats. Okay, how come you don't dream so many dogs and cats in your mind? Because you mostly focus on humans. Anyway, so in, in, in the case of, um, ah, I, I lost my thought. Um, <laughs> um, what was I saying? Um, one person. Yeah, imagine it has thousand classes, right? And you know the, what the actual things in the image are. And you know the canonets or whatever which we'll be talking about. Are able to learn them and they're able to get up to 97, 99% accuracy. Imagine the following crazy image net competition where I take the data, each uh, image, and give it a random label from the 1000 labels. So I take Rob, say, your cat. And I take this person and say, you are a fish. And you take somebody else and say, you are an Alaskan husky. You somehow tend to think that the stuff that we are learning are learnable because there is some kind of irregularity in the labels. For example, it is unlikely you would think that a labeling scheme which says, I let's say, I'm human, but this person is a fish, is probably not likely to be true. Because all humans will kind of be closer. You give this randomly labeled data to a neural network, it will learn it. It will completely learn it in the sense it will drive down the training data error to zero. That means at that point of time, neural network is a nice way of remembering mnemonics, essentially. So I, I start calling you X, you st I start calling you Y, Z, W, etc., etc. Now I've forgotten what I called the first guy. Well, neural network remembers. That has nothing to do with learning. That's just remembering. That's just memorization. And because it has high enough capacity, it can learn pretty much any arbitrary labels. Okay? So, uh, so this is sort of what you will wind up doing in the case of capacity and overfitting. And if you're using dropout, then you can always start with a large network and have less worry about overfitting, typically. Before dropout, by the way, dropout is one of these things that I shouldn't mention too much because it's patented now. Before dropout, people, what they will do is they will do optimal brain damage, which is they learn a large network start removing some connections and retrain it. And if you do that, you can reduce the overfitting. You're essentially reducing the capacity and seeing if the network is able to learn the concept with less capacity. That reduces, that does a better chance of stopping overfitting. But dropout basically does that for you behind the scenes. Okay, so that is something um, that we can do in terms of um, ensuring. Uh, so by the way, the other name for optimal brain damage, this is the old name. 
this is before 90s. Now you should say distillation. <laughs> After 2015. A distillation essentially is take a big network, train a big network on your training data, and then use this network itself to produce labels for other data. And then give this training data to train a smaller network which has fewer weights. That's called distillation. That's kind of you reduce the number of parameters. And you're seeing if you can reduce the parameters and 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 you know get the same accuracy, A, you could have reduced the overfitting, and B, it'll also work on your dinky little cell phone. Because these networks have to work on your cell phone. And the smaller it is, the better off you are. So the guy who just got hired, in Chang Jiang, uh, last week, last year, he, you know, he just got hired this year. Um, he basically does neural network compression algorithms, and which essentially are connected to distillation. Yes. Uh, so let's say if our network is overfitting, so if we don't want to drop out, can we reduce the number of training samples that we're training on to essentially? Nobody, will, nobody would do that in general. That's, if you ever think about that, hit yourself hard in the back. Do you see what I'm saying? You don't improve your exam performance by not looking at the entire textbook. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, the textbook is too big. Let me just focus on the first three pages. I won't overfit, but you will over, underfit extremely well. You'll get like one point or something. Okay, right? That's, no, nobody ever... If you ever think, I have a bright idea of not using training data, wake yourself up. Okay? You should always use the training data. You should change something else. Data is hard to get. Why would you not use it? It's like textbooks are hard to write. Saying, why could you not have written a smaller textbook? I would have paid the bigger money for a smaller textbook. No, it doesn't make any sense. Okay? But it's a good question. Okay, that finally gets us to the interesting part of today's lecture, which is, yes? It's basically the way to talk about is it learning something or not is this, this curves. That's it. There is no additional rich uncle who can tell you that you can rest easy. Genders have been classified correctly. There's no such thing. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, no, again, if, that, if it does not make test data noise go down to zero, that basically might have been because it doesn't have the capacity. Mm -hmm. Or because you chose not to go all the way down for whatever reason. Okay, there is no simple answer to has it learned other than this. That's the point I'm trying to get you to understand. There is no better answer to have you learned than your scores on the test. However bad the test is. Because lobotomy is not still allowed. It used to be allowed old days, but not now. And lobotomy doesn't tell you a thing. You know, if I open your brain, I won't know what the heck happened. And if I open a large 350-layer network, I have no idea what it learned. This is the only currency that you have. So that brings us to the last part of today's lecture, which is, oh my god, okay, uh, which is that this stuff that I just talked about, um, sorry, this stuff I talked about, about capacity versus overfitting, essentially is using the theory of learning that sort of works in the traditional learning tasks. The thing that's actually interesting for the high dimensional learning tasks, which is the, the image recognitions and so on, is in the traditional learning theory it says that if you drive the training error down to zero, you will be overfitting. So you should stop before the training error becomes zero. But if you actually use these things on high dimensional data, typically with common nets, which has this particular type of neural networks, we'll talk about in the next class, um, uh, but on um, um, image data, for example, which is a very high dimensional data, um, 
nobody in their right mind stops before that training data becomes zero. In fact, the, the uh, thumb rule is not only should you make the training data zero, but continue, keep on training, even when the training data has become zero. When the, even, even after the training error has become zero. Okay, training error becoming zero, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so what that basically means is that, um, let's see, so in the, the old idea was to stop overfitting, try fitting a lower order polynomial instead of the 350th order one. So keep the capacity of the network low so that it won't overfit. Now what you do, you start with a very large networks. Oftentimes, networks which have more tunable weights than there is training data. So you could have like 1.3 billion weights and 8 million training data. You think 8 million training data is big, but there are 1.3 billion weights. You can learn any random thing. Any random noise pattern you can learn in that case. So the question then is, uh, um, we are starting with very high capacity networks, and they in fact reach zero training error very easily. Should they be overfitting? They must be overfitting. And why are we using it? That's where we are. They seem to work. That's the part of engineering. OK? <laughs> And yes, that's what it is. They may well be overfitting. So this, here be the dragon slide, is from a talk in like a couple of months back. So as I said, we once we start getting into this stuff, you know, um, basically much of this theory is just not there. People are trying to figure out. So one candidate which caught my attention, and you know, a bunch of people tend to think it might actually, you know, survive. Um, it is really this work by Misha Belkin. Uh, he actually had a paper in ICML 2019. Um, and uh, in fact, you can get that particular talk, a talk that he gave at that particular link, you know, in, in the slides, you can click on that. Um, the interesting point that he makes is that in a sense, what actually happens in many of these high dimensional data, empirically speaking, is instead of having a single U bias variance curve, that means as the training error becomes zero, uh, first the test error reduces and then starts increasing. If you continue changing weights beyond this point, then this is basically called the interpolation point. At this point, you have fit yourself to every training data. So interpolation would have happened, for example, if I have points like this with some points off, right? And then I would go. That way. That's interpolation point. That means it's perfectly fitting the training data. They are continuing beyond that point. Most of the time, neural network training for these large scale networks continues beyond this point. When it continues beyond that point, what you will find is actually the training, the test, law, test error, which has increased, will then start coming down. OK? And this is in the very bleeding edge of our understanding about how neural networks are working. But without that, actually, what's happening doesn't make any sense because most of the networks should be overfitting. They are, in some weird sense, overfitting. But this particular way, what is happening is you did start with some test data from the same ImageNet database. You picked some number of pictures, and you picked uh, they kept you kept them far away, and you trained your network with just the training data, and you kept checking its. Uh, accuracy on the test data that's far away, and it kept reducing. What happens, however, when you do that, is when you do this kind of interpolation, all these points are getting labels that don't make any sense. 
In some sense, they're not on the light. They're not supposed to be on the light. They're noise. You should not have learned them. But you learn everything. But if you learn them, and so if there is, if in fact, this you would expect is because of the noise in the data, noise in the labels. That means these points are not supposed to have been there. But you wound up putting them and learning those points too. What that then means is that you are essentially learning the noise in the data, because of which you will start misclassifying not just these points, a whole bunch of other points. For example, a point that was like in this area now would get some random label like that. Okay? But that doesn't change the test error because the test data was selected beforehand with the same distribution. What it does change is this, so when you actually go far beyond this, in fact, there's some interesting things that I won't have time to get into, but what winds up happening is that there are so many features to reduce the training data's error that you will start picking better and better features such that the weights associated with those features, the norm of those weights is minimized. They become smaller as you go on. So this becomes a smoother interpretation, interpolation than in the beginning. So as you go forward, essentially you are doing better and more smooth interpretation. But the thing that this leads to is this interesting part, which is, so how many of you have seen this stuff? I may have mentioned it earlier. This is completely connected to this. It allows for dense set of dense set of adversarial examples. Now, adversarial examples were never even you, I never even told you that there can be adversarial examples. Machine learners are supposed to just assume that from the, the, the training and test sets were picked from the same distribution. But if I give you trick questions and make you fall flat on your face and I jump up and down in glee, that's possible. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Except if your decisions wind up being life and death decisions, such as I basically give you a stop sign which looks exactly like a stop sign with a little noise and your Tesla says, this says go at 65 miles per hour. So you continue going at 65 miles per hour. Along the Tesla goes, so you go because you're the Tesla. And then you will be under the truck a little later. These are called adversarial examples. So what is happening in this particular case is here is a school bus. I added some noise to this bus, just a fraction of this noise, such that I get this. Which is an ostrich, you already know, right? Similarly, there is a puppy, you have some noise, ostrich again, right? Now, the interesting thing, of course, is it is possible that the world is full of ostriches, but I don't know if I mentioned this to you, there 